Ladies and gentlemen, it's a special day today. The 1st of April, also known as April Fool's Day. A day whereby we have a bit of a laugh, a bit of a joke, and a bit of a prank. The annual day of comedy, whereby no one is to be trusted, for they may well be trying to fool you. Jester approved. However, you have to admit, over the last few years, April Fool's Day hasn't really been as effective as it used to be. Mostly, as when your country is constantly ran like a clown show, it feels like every day is April Fool's Day. In fact, it would probably be a better idea to rebrand April Fool's Day into April Normalcy Day, whereby people are forced to act normal for just one day a year. Though honestly, I think I'm asking for a bit too much with that one. As it's April Fool's Day, I thought I'd address a concept that's been rising in popularity as of late. A concept known as Clown World. I'm sure if you've spent any time on the internet over the past two years or so, that you've probably seen this phrase used all over the place. I mean, my word, there's even been a song made about this at this point. The concept of Clown World is quite simple to understand. It kind of goes without saying that today, our society functions in an utterly backwards fashion, almost as if it has been completely flipped upside down. Whereas in the past, being overweight was considered unhealthy and shameful, today, being overweight is considered not just healthy, but beautiful. Whereas in the past, progressives universally would fight for equality and meritocracy, Today, many progressives fight for segregation and discrimination. Whereas in the past, comedians would make jokes and the news would inform us, today, comedians inform us and the news makes jokes. And the list goes on and on and on. We went from America good to America bad. From free speech to hate speech. From an open internet to a centralized internet. Needless to say, if someone from the year 2000 went into a coma and woke up today, they'd be absolutely horrified. And that, ultimately, is the essence of Clown World. People who believe in the Clown World concept state that most people, the masses, can no longer think for themselves anymore. And as such, there's only a very small number of people remaining who are actually intelligent enough to see that our society is now completely backwards and slowly heading towards totalitarian oblivion. However, I just don't think it's that simple. Firstly, is the world really made up of clowns? I mean, I don't know where you are, dear viewer, but if I went outside and asked random people in the street how things are going, they certainly wouldn't be making any jokes. People aren't happy, not with their government, the economy, celebrities, anything, really. In fact, I don't know a single person at all who genuinely believes, hand on heart, that their life is better today than it was in, say, the 90s or the 2000s. Yes, there are some people out there who believe everything they see on TV, the Redditors, the Funko Pop collectors, but honestly, they tend to be pretty rare. Well, unless you're in London or California, but that's a story for another time. Secondly, it's not really the world that has a problem, is it? It's the Western world. China, for example, is doing better than ever and is rapidly on the way to achieving superpower status. Meanwhile, can anyone really say with a straight face that the United States, or even my home country of the United Kingdom, is heading in an upwards trajectory? No. But, hang on a minute. If I'm right, and Western countries aren't completely made up of clowns, yet at the same time, our nations are clearly in a state of decline, then what exactly is going on? Well, folks, this is where I'd like to introduce you to a concept that I like to call the Pantomime Society. Again, I don't know where in the world you are, dear viewer, but in the UK, we have these shows called Pantomimes. It's kind of like theatre, whereby people dress up in very flamboyant costumes and put on a dramatic show in front of an audience. Oh yes I do! Oh no you don't! Oh yes I do! Oh no you don't! No? <laughs> well anyway, much like watching a movie or playing a video game, pantomimes are of course works of fiction. People dress up, wear masks, and pretend to be someone that they're not. And that is all part of the fun. Engaging in a play, 
a fantasy, escaping the woes of the humdrum daily life into a temporary period of excitement. So what, exactly, is a pantomime society? Well, imagine a society whereby people were constantly wearing masks. A society whereby almost everything was theatre. A society whereby what people think and what people say are often two very different things. Hmm, sounds familiar. These pictures were taken of Emmanuel Macron, the President of France, after a tense diplomatic exchange. Yet, they look like something out of a Netflix special. Who took these pictures, and why were they allowed to do so? Or what about this video of British Prime Minister Boris Johnson dramatically role-playing as if he's Winston Churchill just after an actual war had started? ...who will never see their families again. And to my Russian friends... Я не верю, что эта война от вашего имени. This crisis, this tragedy, can and must come to an end. Perhaps one of the strangest videos I've ever seen... ...in my life. Or who can forget the endless videos captured of politicians worldwide lecturing the public on mask wearing, despite the fact that many only seem to put them on when the cameras start rolling. Regardless, despite all the blatantly bizarre theatrics, many people within said pantomime society seem to have made the conscious decision to no longer correspond with reality. Instead, choosing to immerse themselves within the fantasy, blindly going along with whatever society tells them. Here's four examples. Example number one, the paradox of education. We are told from a young age that so long as we work hard, then we can get rich. Yet mathematically speaking, not everyone can get rich. As if everyone is rich, then nobody really is. Despite this, people still willingly get in debt to get a piece of paper of which they can use to beg for employment, whereby they think to themselves that one day they'll make it. Yet the reality is that the truly wealthy are not those who are employed, but those who employ. Deep down, everyone knows this, as it's obvious when you really think about it. Yet why is it that no one but the most elite in society are actually taught to think this way? Could it possibly be, because if everyone found out the truth about how our economy really functions, that everyone would stop working tomorrow? Hey, hey, you're asking too many questions. Get back to work. You want to be rich, don't you? Example number two, the paradox of logic. Recently, there's been a lot of controversy in the United States in regards to the topic of womanhood. And I've been reading what some of the journalists have to say on the matter, and I have to say, it is truly mind-blowing. USA Today. Scientists agree that there is no sufficient way to clearly define what makes someone a woman. And with billions of women on the planet, there is much variation. But, wait a minute. If there's no sufficient way to clearly define what makes someone a woman, then how can you possibly know that there are billions of women on the planet? Whoa, whoa, don't question the media. These guys are authoritative. You aren't. Zip it. Example number three, the paradox of justice. When terrorists bomb our nations and kill innocent civilians, we view that as a crime against humanity, which it absolutely is. Yet when we, oh I don't know, overthrow governments, topple regimes, bomb civilians, torture innocents, take advantage and much, much more, we call that justice. Hey, hey, are you disrespecting our brave troops? Hey, put your hand on your head and say thank you for your service. Example number four, the paradox of democracy. We are told that we live in the free world. An open, democratic society, whereby unlike those foul dictatorships, here, we the people are in charge. Yet, as I've said many times in the past, if corporations can simply buy out politicians from all of the main parties, then doesn't that mean that regardless of who wins, nothing really ever changes anyway? Well, don't just take my word for it. Take a listen to what Joe Biden had to say about the system a few years back. Well, I'm not sure you should assume I'm not corrupt, but I thank you for that, though. The system does produce corruption, and in, in, I think implicit in the system is corruption, when in fact 
whether or not you can run for public office, and it costs a great deal of money to run for the United States Senate, even from a small state like Delaware, uh, you have to go to those people who have money, and they always want something. Oh, please, don't listen to him. What does he know about politics? I mean, after all, he's only the president of the United States. I think you get the point. My argument with the pantomime society is that the way that life is presented to us is not more than a fiction, and an obvious one at that. But it's not so much that the masses can't see this, but that many simply pretend that they can't, due to being fearful of the consequences of what might happen should they step out of line. Thus, instead choosing to willingly overwrite their own sense of right or wrong, via letting the authorities of the time do the thinking for them. To prove this point, I'd like to refer you to one of the most famous psychological experiments of all time. The Milgram Experiment. Picture this. It's 1961 and you're an American. As you walk down the street, you come across a notice board. The notice board states that for just an hour of your time, you can get paid a whopping $4. Four dollars in 1961 being around $30 today. Not bad. It states that no special training, education, or experience is required, and that you just need to be between the ages of 20 to 50 to participate. You in? Yes, you are. So you head on over there and find yourself being greeted by a scientist in a white lab coat. The scientist then introduces you to a random man who looks just like someone else they also got off the street. The scientist then connects the random man to a shock machine and puts the controls of said machine in front of you. The scientist then tells you that at certain times, he's going to ask you to press the button to activate the shock machine, whereby the random man will then get shocked and he can monitor the effects from afar. Each time he asks you to press the button, the voltage of the shocks will increase, and all you have to do is keep pressing the button when asked, and you'll get your four dollars. At first, the shocks don't seem that bad, a little buzz here and there, so you keep pressing when asked. But eventually, the shocks seem to be getting completely out of hand. The random man slowly starts screaming in pain at the top of his lungs every time you press it, begging you to stop. Despite this, the scientist tells you to keep going. Alright, so stop. What do you do in this situation? Do you A. Recognise that the random man is clearly in a large amount of pain and refuse to continue pressing the button? Or B. Trust the authority of the scientist that they know what they're doing and finish what you signed up to do? This was the entire basis of the Milgram experiment. Would people trust their own sense of right and wrong, or instead put their faith in an authoritative figure? The experiment was conducted on 40 men. The general consensus of psychologists before the experiment occurred was that an estimate of just 1 out of the 40 participants, or just 3%, would shock the random man to the maximum voltage. In reality, 26 out of the 40 participants, or 65%, actually did. All of the 40 participants questioned the experiment in some regard, but whenever they did, the scientist was instructed to respond with four verbal cues, one after another. At first, they were simply reassured with a, please continue. But if they objected again, they would be told that the experiment requires that you continue, which led to a, it is absolutely essential that you continue, to a final, you have no other choice, you must go on. If after the fourth verbal cue the participant still refused, the experiment simply ended. Only 14 out of the 40 participants, just 35%, refused all the way. The experiment has been repeated many times in the years and decades since, and the results have remained more or less the same. So, what does this experiment actually tell us about the nature of human beings? It tells us that one third of humanity can be categorised as wolves who think for themselves and follow their own mind. Meanwhile, two thirds of humanity can be categorised as sheep who simply do whatever those in power tell them to, regardless of their own personal hesitations. And keep in mind, the Milgram experiment was conducted using men only. Psychologists have observed that women tend to have a higher level of agreeableness than men, so the number of sheep for the whole of humanity on average could be even higher. People often look back at history with horror, at the sheer unbelievable crimes against humanity that we tend to do to one another in the name of politics, religion, or anything, really. 
We look at past totalitarian dystopian regimes and say with confidence that if we would have been there, then we would have rebelled against it. But the reality is that most people simply wouldn't. To use some 20th century communist dictators as an example, under the reign of Pol Pot, in what we know today as the Cambodian Genocide, an estimated 2 million Cambodians, more than a quarter of the entire population of the country, would be killed. During Joseph Stalin's tenure at the helm of the Soviet Union, it's estimated that over 20 million Soviet citizens were either sent off to gulags or simply starved to death due to famine under his leadership. And under Chairman Mao, during China's so-called Great Leap Forward, it's estimated that over 45 million Chinese citizens died due to a combination of famine and direct executions. Millions of people perished under the reign of these three dictators. However, how many people did these men actually kill by their own hands? Zero, zero, and zero. In all such situations, though the dictators themselves are often remembered for the atrocities committed under their reign, in reality, it's always those below them who did the dirty work for them. AKA, the sheep. Everyone has a conduct, meaning how they deal with the problems that come their way. People who think for themselves and aren't afraid to show it, the wolves, have a righteous conduct. They live in pursuit of the truth, no matter how unpopular it makes them. American President Abraham Lincoln once asked a crowd of people, how many legs a dog would have if you counted the tail as a leg? When the crowd answered five, he responded, no, the answer was still four, as just because you decided to call the tail a leg doesn't actually make it so. Yet there are also those people who have a cowardly conduct, the sheep, and to describe them, a certain quote comes to mind. The rules are simple. They lie to us. We know they're lying. They know that we know they're lying. But they keep lying, and we keep pretending to believe them. We humans are naturally social creatures. We all like to feel as if we're a part of something much bigger than ourselves. To fit in. To belong. But the way I see it is, when in hell, angels shouldn't expect to find much company. Over the last few years, everyone living in the Western world has been lied to, deceived, manipulated, and abused, in more ways than one. Our leaders think we're idiots, our media treats us like idiots, and our education system turns us into idiots. But the problem, ultimately, isn't them. As the old saying goes, evil only thrives when good men do nothing, and the sheep do nothing. They know our society is sick, fatally so, and is only getting worse with each passing day. Yet despite this, they say nothing, scared of losing what little they have. Be honest with me now, dear viewer. If you were to look back and analyse your time on Earth, how many times have you bent the knee to authority for an easy life? How many times have you had an unpopular opinion that you've been too scared to share? How many times have you allowed yourself to be manipulated into living in fear? If you were to take a long, hard look in the mirror, what is it that you'd see? A wolf or a sheep? The cowardly censor themselves, scared of the consequences of saying what their eyes merely see. But the righteous always speak their mind, even when the voice of hesitation that has been pre-programmed into them tells them otherwise. The cowardly embrace degenerative vices, such as alcohol, smoking, drugs, gambling, pornography, and excessive gaming and eating, destroying themselves with distractions. But the righteous are sensible, taking everything in moderation and caring for their health and fitness to the best of their ability. The cowardly possess no sense of curiosity or wonder, rotting in a sense of nihilistic despair. But the righteous have learned to rediscover the spirituality that has been beaten out of them, and understand that there's more to this world than what meets the eye. The cowardly worship authority figures, and fool themselves into believing everything they are told. But the righteous question everything that comes out of any government or corporation's mouth, and understand that ultimately, they are self-serving constructs. The cowardly view themselves as worthless and disposable, lowering their standards throughout life, never demanding better. 
But the righteous know that they have value and do not allow themselves to be disrespected by poor partners, foolish friends or stupid strangers. The truth is that if every coward turned righteous overnight, there would be no such thing as our elite. We would be the elite. Today, the greatest virtue is not to be rich, powerful or even famous. You don't have to have the brains of Einstein nor the strength of Hercules. No. Today, the greatest virtue is to simply tell the truth. Our neoliberal elite want you to feel powerless. They want you to feel weak and subservient. But most of all, they want you to feel alone. But you're not alone. Far from it, in fact. The truth is that our leaders have become too complacent, too cocky, and in their self-assurance have accidentally set in motion an inferno that they are now desperately trying to extinguish. This process, the unmasking, is now inevitable. But it won't be overnight. It will be a slow, multi-decade long process, triggered in waves by numerous odd events that will test the bravery of the common people. We've seen many such events over the last few years, and there will be many more to come. So how about we take off the pantomime masks and start being honest with ourselves? There's something very wrong with our society, isn't there? All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. A little bit depressing, I think, but hey, when do I not make something that's depressing? <laughs> But before you go, I want to know in the comment section down below, are you a wolf? Are you a sheep? Do you believe in the pantomime society concept? Or do you think that people are really just this stupid? You know, reading the comments is always my favourite part of doing all this because I really like reading what people have to say, positive or negative. Uh, there's just something about comments that, uh, I don't know, it just gets me going. I, I, I don't know what it is. So... I, you know, I read them all, so I'm really, I'm really curious what you have to think about this one because it's been something that's been on my mind for quite some time, how fake everything seems to be. You know, you turn on the television or you listen to the radio, probably the only person that listens to the radio, or even play a game, and you can tell that there's been some, art, there's some artificial agenda, and the way that people just eat it up is so disturbing. But anyway. Last week I set up a Patreon, and so I'd like to thank, personally, Philippe and Kekken for supporting these productions. It means a lot to me. So, welcome to the Wall of Fame, gentlemen. Alright, hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time.